oftentimes people will ask, what is it that God wants from me? How is it that I can live in a way that he's going to be pleased with, that I'm going to do the things that uh, he has called me to do? Well, learn a very simple principle to understand. What God wants you to do in every circumstance and situation is to worship him. That is to behave in a way that brings him honor. And if you set your heart and your mind, you make that your utmost prayer requests, and you study God's word so that you might know his truth. We've talked about how wisdom is putting truth into action. If you do those things, you are going to find that you are going to live a pleasing, victorious life to Messiah Yeshua. God's going to indeed be well pleased with you. And these other things in your life, God is going to take ownership over them. He is going to be your defender. He is going to work these things out. He will give you guidance and inspiration. And you're going to see how your life comes into the order of God. But what's the key to that? You desiring to worship Him. And no one knows how much God wants you to worship as Satan does. And that's why Satan is so opposed to people worshiping God. That's what he hates more than anything else. And that's what we're to see as we continue on in our study of Revelation and chapter 13. So with that said, take out your Bible once more and look with me to the book of Revelation chapter 13. And let's go back to verse 7 for a few minutes. We saw last week, and this is surprising to many people. They are shocked to find out that there's going to be an evil empire that rises up in the last days. This empire is going to be blasphemous. This empire is going to set its mind, its character in opposition to the things of God. What God says is good, this empire is going to see as, as evil. What God sees as evil, this empire is going to embrace. And here's the truth we saw last week that this empire is going to wage war with who? The saints. Many people say, well, those are the Old Testament saints. That's, that's Israel. Well, he's going to wage war with Israel after this. But it's very clear here that we're talking about who? We're talking about believers. Those who have the testimony of Messiah Yeshua in their life. Now, what I want you to see here, if you look very closely, let's move on to verse 8. Who's going to worship this, this empire, this beast? Verse 8 says, And all who dwell upon the earth, dwellers of the earth. Now here again, over and over in this book of Revelation, we have seen this expression, those who dwell upon the earth, have nothing to do with where they're physically located. It has to do with where their allegiance is. Are they committed to this world or... The other ones are dwellers of heaven. They're on earth as well, but their commitment is in the kingdom of God. So those who are earthly minded, those who live according to the flesh, those who walk according to the standards of this world rather than the standards of God, they are going to be not uh, uh, obedient. They are going to be worshipers of the beasts. Why? Because the beast is going to tell them exactly what they want to hear. He is going to bring prosperity and security to the world in the short term. He is going to allow for people to do what is right in their own eyes for a season. And after what we could call false blessings that he gives to the world, gives to Israel, he is going to manifest his true nature and what he desires. Remember that we're talking about an empire that is ruled by Satan. And what does Satan want? What's with this battle where he was cast out from the heavens? Well, we can look at it, what it says in the book of Isaiah. When Satan wanted to take his throne and place it over God's throne. He wanted to be number one. He wanted to be worship. Who's Satan? Satan was the angel, the lead angel for the worship of God. And he rebelled against that because he wanted to be worshipped. And that's what this is all about. So what is he going to do? He's going to deceive. We've already seen that he's going to deceive the world and those who dwell in it. That is a worldly mindset. And those people, look again at verse 8. It says, 
and all who dwell upon the earth, they are going to worship him, this, this, this empire, whose names are not written in the book of life, which is of the lamb that was slain from the foundation, from before the foundations of the earth. So those who do not have a personal relationship with this sacrificial lamb, and who is this sacrificial lamb? Obviously, Messiah Yeshua. Those who do not have the blood of Messiah, who has produced in them that blood regeneration. Anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. And part of that is that his mind has been, been redeemed as well. We're supposed to have the mind of Messiah. So when these things start happening, we're going to be able to discern who this is. We're going to understand his character. We're going to understand his deceitful methodology. And we're not going to worship him. Those of us who want, who belong to Messiah, who have that testimony, whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Move on. It says in verse 9, all who has an ear, let him hear. Now, this is important. Remember how I talked about the book of Revelation is a book that uses literary tools, devices, means, methodology in order to convey truth to us? Does that sound familiar to you? Where it says in this, this verse, all who has an ear, let him hear. This is something that is said to each of the seven congregations in, in, in Asia Minor. What we studied in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, each one of these epistles to each of these seven congregations, what we find is that the section ended by, he who has an ear, let him hear. So this is a literary device. John is trying to communicate to us that this refers to the believing community. What we could call those who have been called out of this world. What does that mean? That's what the term ecclesia, or what we translate church, means. Those who are called out of this world and called into the kingdom of heaven. We've been called out. We belong to the kingdom of heaven, but we live here temporarily. We're those sojourners and strangers in this world. So that's who he's speaking about here. Look again at verse 9. Very short verse. All who has an ear, let him hear. A terminology, that verse is saying, I'm speaking to the church. Verse 10, and all who leads into captivity, they are going to go into captivity. All who kills by the sword, they are going to what? They are going to be killed by the sword. For with this is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, that verse is so important. We need to pause for a moment and understand here. See, Israel, unbelieving Israel, in the last days, we've already seen this in our previous Two lessons from Revelation chapter 12. In the last days, Israel's going to flee into the wilderness. Why? Because if a Jewish person dies who have not accepted Messiah Yeshua, it says it's appointed unto man to die once, and after that, the judgment. So if that person dies, we're going to see a verse that supports this in a moment, how horrible it is for those who die outside of faith. Why? They are eternally lost. So Israel's being to told to flee into the wilderness where God's going to sustain them in order to bring them to faith. But that's not his message to, to believers, to the church. We are not supposed to go into captivity. We're not supposed to fight with the sword. We're supposed to what? Stand strong, stand up, and be accounted. Why? It doesn't matter what the enemy does to our flesh and body. It doesn't matter what he takes from us physically. We are not going to bow the knee. We're not going to confess anything other than Messiah Yeshua. He is Lord. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So what it's saying here is that we need not flee. We, we don't need to fight. Our flesh is not, our battle is not against flesh and blood. What are we supposed to do? Endure. How do we endure? Look at that end of verse, verse 10. We are going to have endurance or perseverance through what? faith. And it's the faith of who? The saints. Those who have been sanctified. That's what the word saint means. Those who have been sanctified and set apart for a purpose. And what is that? We are willing to die for our faith. 
And many of us read what it says in the book of Matthew 24, verses 9 through 14. It talks clearly about those being persecuted because of the name of Messiah. Not just looking at that, going back to the destruction of the second temple in 70 A.D., all of that has to do with the last days. Well, let's move on. Look now to verse 11. Verse 11 is key because now we see, although I have mentioned the Antichrist, really what we've talked about, we've talked about the beast, and the beast is an empire. We, we don't know anything about the Antichrist now, although there's been a hint to him and his character. His character is going to be the character of that empire. And why do I say that? Well, now move, if you would, to verse 11. John is still receiving vision. It says here in verse 11, I looked and another beast was coming up from the earth, from the land. Now, notice the difference. When we talk about the sea, what should come into our mind? Instability. Things that are not not uh, stable and in order, in other words, chaos. And that's what Messiah is talking about in Matthew 24, verses 6, 7, and 8. These wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, all these things that bring social chaos, political instability, all these things, financial and economic ruin. All these things are going to be going on. People are going to be desperate. And what's going to happen? They're going to be looking to different uh, governments, and all of them are going to be insufficient. And what we learned is this, that there's going to be suddenly a new government. This government's going to come up. It is going to rule over the world. It is going to bring stability short term, and it's going to bring about the means for the manifestation of the Antichrist. And that's what we're talking about in verse 11. Why do I say that? Verse 11. I looked and another beast coming up from the earth. And to him were what? He had two horns. Like the horns of a lamb. Now this is clear. The Antichrist. The Antichrist will manifest himself. He will come out of this empire and he is going to be the leader of this empire. And he is going to bring stability, and it's because of the stability that the, this evil empire brings about that the Antichrist will be put into power. He is going to take his position of leadership over this empire. So it says, To him were two horns, horns like a lamb, but notice that he speaks like what? He speaks like a dragon. That is, his words are not going to be the words of God, but the words of the dragon. That is Satan. Verse, verse 10. And he is going to exercise all the authority over the first beast. What does that mean? It's just uh, biblical language to say he's going to rule over the empire. That's all it's saying. He's going to recognize or have authority over this empire, over the first beast. Before him, and he's going to bring the whole world and those who dwell in it, remember that, the dwellers of the world, to bow down to worship the beast, the first beast, which, what, had this, this death blow and was healed. Now, I need to pause for a moment because this is the second time we've talked about this, this blow. And what it's referring to here is an empire that the world's going to think was totally destroyed, but it's going to manifest itself again. This empire is going to be one that is disastrous, one that was wicked, one that the world did not want, but it's going to manifest itself again. The world's going to be amazed. The world is going to feel hopeless to stand against it. The world is going to be shocked by its power, its supernatural power, and it's going to do what? Just what we saw. It's going to follow after it. It's going to submit to it. It's going to worship it. Now here again, how do we begin this message? We talked about how important worship is. The right worship of God and the wrong worship of Satan. There's no position in between. What I want you to see is this. If you live up until the end of this age, you're going to find that there's no position in between. You are either going to worship the lamb or you're going to worship the false lamb, the Antichrist.
There is no position where you say, well, I don't want to worship. You don't want to worship, you'll be put to death. That's what the scripture is going to say in the next few minutes. So what I want you and myself to understand is that worship is key. And this empire is going to be one that we thought was destroyed, but it's going to manifest itself again. And that fact is going to be so important when we get to Revelation and chapter 17, because there we're going to be posed with a very important question. Now, remember, how many heads does this beast have? Seven. We talked about last week, we named them, we're going to name them again when we get to Revelation 17. But just so that we have a good understanding, let's go over them again. They are Egypt, Assyria, Babylon. The fourth one is the Medes and the Persians together. The fifth is the, the Greece. Six is Roman. And then there's that seven, that mystical one, that, that, that very, very strong, powerful, unique one that Daniel speaks of. But here's what we're going to see. This seventh one comes and it's the shortest of all, meaning its rule, its administration is very brief and it's going to be done away with. But the seventh is also going to be, and here's the revelation we're going to see in chapter 8 or chapter 17. The seventh one who was destroyed is also going to be the eighth and this is that final empire that we're going to study in great detail in Revelation chapter 17. So that's why this, this, this head being healed is so important. Well, let's move on. Look with me, if you would, to verse, to verse 13. Now, remember, we talked about how God is going to allow those who will not believe, who will not submit, who rebel against the truth, that they're going to be deceived because of their unbelief. And God is going to send strong delusion. The idea here is he's going to allow that. Why? Look, if you would, to verse 13. And to this, this Antichrist, that's who we're talking about, beginning in verse 11. It was given to him to do great signs, even for fire to come down from the heavens towards the earth before the eyes of, of all the people. Now, here's what I want you to see. It is vital that we learn this biblical truth. There are those, when we're going to get into the last days and the battles and the wars we're going to be talking about in Revelation chapter 16, Armageddon and such, and the terrible things that happen in those final plagues known as the bold judgments that we'll speak about in Revelation chapter 16. There's many people that want to speak of these things in natural means. They're going to say this is a nuclear war. And they like to see some of the descriptions. And they want to say, well, well, these are, are different weapons. There's this type of plane, this type of helicopter, this type of tank. All of that is ridiculous. Because what is God wanting to do? God wants to manifest himself in an undeniable way. And he is going to do things that are supernatural, that the only conclusion is that it's God. We're going to see how the people respond to that, that truth later on. But Satan, what is he going to do through the Antichrist? He's going to do a false or what we could say a counterfeit presentation. That's what Satan does. He is the father of what lies and deceit. So that's what we're seeing here because his work is going to, cons going to confirm his unrighteousness where God's great works are going to confirm his righteousness. And that's going to be an important term. The righteous judgments of God are going to manifest themselves over and over in the next few chapters. But look again, verse, verse 13. It was given to him to do all these great signs, even that fire comes down from the heavens towards the earth, before all human beings. Verse 14, what is, what's going to be the outcome of that? That he is going to deceive. Deceive who? Those who dwell upon the earth. That phrase over and over appears. And remember, it's always in, in, in connection with those who dwell upon the earth, those who dwell upon the heavens, those who are kingdom-minded and those who are not. So those who are earthly-minded, who live according to the flesh, 
they're going to do what? They're going to be deceived by the means of these signs that was given to him, this, this beast, this antichrist to do before, before the empire. And it says that they're going to do this with uh, all types of, of signs before those who dwell upon the earth to make, this is what he's going to say. He's going to say, I'm doing these miracles, these signs, and this is how you need to respond. He says, I want you to make a image. Now, we know that biblically speaking, it is forbidden for us to make idols. And that's what we're talking about here. An image to the beast. What's this is all about? This is about a pledge of loyalty. That's what the Antichrist wants. So here's what we're going to see. You have a choice. You are either going to live in a way that's loyal to Messiah, the Lamb of God, or you are going to be forced to live in a way that is loyal to the Antichrist, the false Messiah, this, this evil empire. And if you're part of this evil empire, what are you going to do? You are going to begin to transgress certain things in the law of God, the basic things in the law of God. You are going to be making an image which is forbidden. It says that they're going to make an image to the beast who was, was struck with this, this, this blow of a sword, but he lives, meaning a resurrection. And it was given to this, 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 this image that it would put life or spirit by the beast into this image on account that he would speak, that is, this image would speak, this image of the beast would speak. And he would make all those who do not worship him, okay, okay, do not worship him in the idol, that they will certainly be put to death. So here's the key. You are either going to be an idol worshiper and follow the, the commandments of the Antichrist, or you're going to follow the commandments of Messiah Yeshua. No position in between. And all of this is about what? Worship. That's what we're going to see. Now, let me just simply state for a few minutes, when this empire first gets going, he's going to have a very pluralistic uh, attitude towards worship. Every man can do what he wants, but, but lo and behold, not soon thereafter, after he gets into power, what's he going to do? He is going to outlaw all other forms of worship. This image that people are going to make is going to be there. It is going to be the eyes of that empire in order to see if you bow down and you worship the image and pledge your loyalty to this, this beast or not. So this is what the scripture is trying to say. Move on, if you would, to verse 15. And it was given to him, this, this empire, to put life into this image that it might live. And on account that he might speak, and he's going to speak and make all those worship him, and all who don't will be put to death. Verse 16, and it says, And you, for all of you, from small and great, poor and rich, those who are free and those who are servants, he is going to make them do something to take the mark on their, their right hand or upon their forehead. That's that mark of the beasts. Now, what is that? Well, notice what it says here, either upon your arm or upon your forehead. Now, remember what I said, there is going to be the exact opposite of what God wants. One of the commandments of scripture, if you come from a Jewish background, you'll know this, the word tefillin. Tefillin also, it's called in the New Testament in English, uh, phylacteries. What do we do? We put a, a box that represents in their, their scripture, that speaks to the commandments of God. And we bind them, le'aniach is the Hebrew word, we bind them upon our arm and upon our head. Why? Arm has to do with work. The forehead has to do with the thought process. So what it's saying is this, that we ought to think and do according to the commandments of God. What does Satan do? He's a counterfeiter. So what is he going to do? He's going to make us take a mark in the very place that we should have the tefillin and on our forehead and on our arm. He's going to want us to have the mark of the beasts. And notice what he says here. Verse, verse 17. For everyone, every man who does not have this mark of the beast, what are they going to do? They are not going to be able to buy or sell. 
if they don't have this mark of the beast or the number of his name. Now, can, you may be the wealthiest person. You may have all these resources. But if you don't take the mark of the beast, you're not going to be able to buy something or sell anything. You're not going to be able to, to commit commerce. Why is that? It's to show us. It is to put true believers in a situation where we depend upon God, not our resources, not our finances, but we depend upon God for all things. That's what God wants to put us into, that we find out that He is trustworthy and He can sustain us. Let's conclude. Look at verse 18. It says, Here is the mind that is wise. For this, this, this beast has a number. It says, Let it be calculated, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 666. Now, that number has great significance. It says, here's the mind that has wisdom. And here's the truth. When these things come about at that time, those who have wisdom will be able to discern the significance of that number and who it points to because it points to a man. Well, I'm out of time until next week when we move on into Revelation in chapter 14.